how do you turn an airplane, and how do you use the turn coordinator to control your turn rate and turn radius as an IFR pilot. In this video, I'm going to go over that in detail. Welcome to Free Pilot Training, I'm Josh, and today we're talking about how to use the turn coordinator to make predictable turns when you're flying in the weather. And this is super important for IFR pilots because if you're in instrument conditions, you wanna fly the airplane as precise as possible. But before we go into that, let's briefly review what makes an airplane turn. When you first started learning how to fly, you may have thought that you turn an airplane by yawing the aircraft one way or another. But now that you've advanced in your training, you now know that you have to bank or roll the airplane along its longitudinal axis to get it to turn. And once again, we do this by rotating the yoke left or right, depending on which direction you want to go. Keep in mind, if you have a stick instead of a yoke, moving the stick left and right does the same thing as rotating the yoke. Now you may remember that our ailerons are tied together, and they're connected in such a way that when we raise one aileron, the other aileron lowers. And if you're wondering why my weird little hands have my thumb sticking up, this is just an easy way to remember which aileron comes up when you rotate the yoke. All you have to do is remember thumbs up, ailerons up. Anyway, this is important because anytime we lower an aileron, we increase the camber of that wing. And this means that this wing now creates more lift, while the aileron on the other side comes up and creates less lift. This in turn rolls the aircraft whichever direction you want to go. But this is only half of the solution. Rolling the airplane by itself won't actually cause the airplane to turn. It'll just cause the airplane to fly straight ahead at this weird tilted little angle. Because of this, there's something else you need to know when you bank the aircraft, if you want it to turn. And this is where things can get a little tricky to understand. When an airplane is in straight and level flight, the lift that your wings produce basically goes straight up. And when an aircraft is in a level attitude like this, we call this vertical lift because it's literally going straight up. But if we roll the airplane one way or another, some of that lift moves laterally. Some of that lift is still going straight up though. If it wasn't, then the airplane would literally fall out of the sky. But the rest of this lift has been transferred laterally along the horizontal axis of the aircraft. And this is what we call the horizontal component of lift, which can be a little tricky to understand because we often associate the word lift with an upward movement. But if the airplane is tilted to one side, some of that lift is going to go this way as well because our total lift is now moving diagonally. Now for some reason, I think this confuses a lot of people. We don't always want the airplane to climb when we turn. If we're trying to make a level turn, we just want the airplane to move this way. But what a lot of people forget is that there are two forces that oppose us anytime we turn the aircraft. And these two forces are weight and inertia. Let's talk about weight first. As you may remember, weight and lift must be equal in order to maintain straight and level flight. So when you roll an airplane to turn it, weight and lift are no longer equal. We just traded some of our vertical lift for horizontal lift. So now weight is greater, which will cause us to descend. Because of this, anytime we roll our wings, we must also increase our total lift by pulling back on the yoke and increasing our angle of attack. And when we increase our angle of attack, this increases our total lift, which brings our vertical lift back up to where it needs to be to keep us from descending. But remember, there are two forces that we have to overcome during a turn, weight and inertia. And in case you forgot, according to Isaac Newton, an object in motion will continue in that motion until acted on by an outside force. This is what we call an inertial force. Your airplane wants to continue going straight ahead. So when you bank the airplane, there's actually a force that resists the horizontal movement of your aircraft. And this is what we call inertia. This is another reason why we need to pull back on the yoke. By increasing total lift, this also increases our horizontal component of lift, which allows us to turn straight this way. And by the way, this is something you need to remember for the test. During a coordinated turn, horizontal lift and inertia are equal. If inertia is greater than horizontal lift, this is when you get a skidding turn, and this can increase your load factor. Keep in mind, the FAA likes to call this centrifugal force, but that's technically not the correct term. It's inertia. But anyway, we must pull back on the yoke to overcome inertia and to keep our airplane from descending. And by the way, if we pull back too much, this can cause our vertical lift to increase too much, which can overcome the weight of our aircraft and cause us to climb during this turn. This is one reason why the FAA wants you to know about load factor. Anytime we bank the airplane, we must overcome the weight and inertia. And these two forces are combined to give us a total force that directly opposes total lift. 
And once again, this is what we call our load factor. If this force is twice the weight of your aircraft, this means that you have a load factor of two Gs. And if this force is three times the weight of your aircraft, you have a load factor of three Gs. And as you can see from this chart, we must pull a very specific amount of Gs to maintain level flight during a turn. Now your training airplane probably doesn't have a G meter, but what you can do is develop a feel for the backstick pressure needed for every turn that you make. This is actually one of the reasons why you practice steep turns a lot during your private pilot training. We wanted you to know what it felt like when you bank the airplane to 45 degrees and you pull 1.4 Gs to keep the airplane level. So to turn the airplane, we need to roll and pull. But here's some new information. Now that you're in a more advanced phase of training, you also need to understand how to control your turn radius and the turn rate of your aircraft. Turn radius is simply the size of the circle you make anytime you turn the aircraft. And there are two main things that directly affect your turn radius, airspeed and bank angle. Now here's what's weird. Higher airspeeds actually increase turn radius. And that's because the faster you're moving, the stronger the force of inertia is. Because of this, faster airplanes generally have a harder time making tight turn radiuses. In addition to this, if you aren't coordinated when you turn, this also increases the force of inertia, which can increase your turn radius as well. Then you have bank angle. The more you roll the wings, the more horizontal lift you create. And this shrinks down your turn radius or makes it tighter. So to put things simply, if you want to shrink your turn radius, you must do one of two things, increase bank angle or decrease airspeed, or both. Turn rate is something else you need to know about, and turn rate is how quickly you can turn your airplane. And your turn rate also depends on your airspeed and bank angle. If you increase your bank angle, you can turn more quickly. If you decrease your bank angle, this decreases your turn rate. That being said, airspeed can make things confusing. The slower you are, the faster you can turn. Once again, this is because inertia is reduced when you fly slower. And when inertia is reduced, this allows us to turn at a faster rate. Now, I do want to mention that turn rate and turn radius are two different things, but they're directly related, and they're both affected by airspeed and bank angle. But you need to understand the difference, because some of the instrument procedures that you're going to be flying are based on turn radius, while others are based on turn rate. Now that you know that, let's talk about how to control our turn rate. We already know that bank angle and airspeed affect our turn rate, but how do we know how quickly our airplane is turning? You guessed it, we can use one of these guys. This is a turn and slip indicator, and this is a turn coordinator. They literally do the same thing, they're just ever so slightly different. Now, here's what's important to know about these things. Most of the time, when you're flying in the weather, ATC is going to expect you to turn the airplane at a standard turn rate. And the standard turn rate is 3 degrees per second. This means that if you turn the airplane a full 360 degrees, it's going to take you two minutes to make the turn. That's why a lot of times you'll see some of these instruments labeled with two minutes on them. If you're making a turn and the needle is centered on this outer mark, you're turning at three degrees a second. And if you pull your shoes off and do the math here, that's where this two minutes comes from. But what if we look down and it's not all the way over at this mark? What does that mean? Well, it means that you're not turning as quickly as you need to be. And this can be super dangerous if the procedure you're flying brings you in through terrain or through areas with a lot of obstructions because your turn radius is bigger in this case. This is important to remember because the national airspace is designed based on you flying standard rate turns, which means that a standard turn radius will keep you inside a protected airspace. So in this case, we just need to tighten our turn radius until we see this. And once again, we do that by increasing our bank angle, slowing down or both. Now, occasionally ATC might ask you to make a turn at half the stator rate. And what do you think you need to do to make that happen? Yeah, we simply shallow our bank angle or we increase our airspeed. And when we see this on the turn and slip indicator, this means that we're turning at 1.5 degrees per second, which means it'll take us four minutes to turn 360 degrees instead of two. Now, the FAA is probably going to ask you some questions about this on the written exam, and there's a good reason for this. Just because your wings are banked, that doesn't mean you're making a good turn. And if you're not turning properly, this is when you start flying into areas that might not be safe because your turn radius is a lot bigger than it should be. In addition to this, ATC often builds spacing based on timing. And if they tell you to make a left 360 and it takes you longer than two minutes, that starts making their job a lot harder, especially if there's no radar available in that area. This can also be helpful during an emergency when you lose some of your other instruments. For example, you can actually turn to a heading based on timing. 
Here's how we could do that. If I know that I'm turning at a standard rate of three degrees per second, this means that if I turn at a standard rate for 30 seconds, I'll turn exactly 90 degrees during that time because three degrees times 30 equals 90. What if I'm turning at half the standard rate? How long would it take me to go from a heading of 360 to 180? Well, that's 180 degrees, isn't it? So if I'm turning at half the standard rate, this means that I'm turning at 1.5 degrees per second. 180 divided by 1.5 equals 120 seconds. So it's gonna take me two minutes to make that turn. In just a minute, I'll show you how the FAA might ask you about this on the written exam. But first, I think it's worth mentioning that 30 degrees of bank doesn't always give you a standard rate turn. Once again, turn rate is a function of airspeed and bank angle. So it's best to use these guys to make a predictable turn. But an easy wag is to take your true airspeed, divide that by 10, and then add half of that. For example, if I'm flying at 120 knots true in my Cessna 172, I could divide that by 10 to get 12. Half of that is 6. 12 plus 6 is 18, so a standard rate turn in my Cessna 172 at 120 knots is going to be about 18 degrees. In small planes like this, it doesn't take much because we're moving so slow. In faster airplanes, it might be closer to 30 degrees, but it's not always 30. Okay, let's look at a couple of these questions. If a pilot turns an aircraft from a 180 heading to a 360 heading and maintains a half standard turn rate throughout the maneuver, how long will it take to complete the turn? What do you guys think? Well, we're turning 180 degrees and then don't let them trick you. It says half the standard turn rate. So this is 1.5 degrees per second. 180 divided by 1.5 is 120 seconds. 120 seconds is two minutes. So this is our answer. Next question. If an airplane's heading indicator fails on a heading of 90 degrees, how long would it take to turn the airplane right to a heading of 120 if the pilot maintains a standard rate turn? Okay, so we're turning 30 degrees because 120 minus 90 is 30. And the turn is being made at a standard rate, so 3 degrees per second. 30 divided by 3 is 10, so it's going to take us 10 seconds, and that's the answer here. As you can see, these questions might be a little tricky, but it's nothing you can't figure out how to do. Just take your time on the test, and remember, a standard rate turn is 3 degrees per second, which means that a half standard turn rate is 1.5. Remembering that will make these questions way easier. Hey, thanks for joining me in this video today. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit the like button for me. It helps the algorithm or something. And also, be sure to check out freepilottraining.net, where you can get cool gear like this hat, or maybe a copy of my new landing book called The Triangle Method. This is a complete guide to landings, and I know what you guys are thinking. You're an instrument pilot and you don't have your landings down yet, but I promise this book will help you. I have a digital copy over there at freepilottraining.net for 10 bucks, or you can get this on Amazon if you like paper books. Thanks for watching, we'll see ya.